Thanks again for the introduction. Uh, my name is Lukas Vogel and I'm from the TU Dresden and this is joint work with Thomas Springer and Matthias Welisch. And I will talk a little bit about the history of the file-based web. So um, just a quick shout out, some thanks to Mark Schuder, to Wendy Hall, to Bebe White for providing me some information about that. And um, so I want to start with a simple introduction here. So uh, what we know is that users love fast web content. Um, so we know that if that users will leave a web page, the majority of users will leave a web page in, uh, if the web page does not load in less than two seconds. So users have a high expectation of fast web pages. However, simultaneously, we also know that there's a lot of economic value in, in fast web pages. Google uh, famously reported that um, they, their ad revenue will drop by 20% if the web page loads 500 milliseconds longer. And Amazon also reported that they have a loss of say, uh, in sales of 1% for every 100 milliseconds their web page gets slower. So it has a high um, um, expectation of users for, for fast web pages, but also a high expectations uh, and a high economic value in fast web pages. However, if you look at the history of the web a little bit, in the beginning, uh, web pages were quite simple. They were just text-based web pages hosted on a single machine. And uh, this, in, in the next 30 years, it uh, uh, developed quite rapidly in, uh, uh, in, into extremely complex multimedia applications, from video streamings to even entire oper operating systems hosted on not just one machine, but a um, distributed uh, infrastructure. And um, if you look at the size of web pages, we see that this uh, shift in, in content also increased the size of web pages. So this is the from the HTTP archive, this is the total size of web pages over the last years. And we can see a clear trend that the web pages will um, get larger and larger. And this trend does not appear to stop. If you in increase the, the timeline as far as that, uh, it gets, then you will see that the, the clear trend of larger and larger web pages. Um, however, if we look at um, um, loading times, so in this uh, case, the first contentful paint, we can see that it kind of stays the same. And what we would expect is to have, have faster web pages. Should, should I use the other microphone? Is it better? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to, uh, to, um, yeah, to have it faster, to go down, because we have an incentive by users and also by the providers of a web page. So there has to be a reason why we don't have faster web pages now. And um, in this talk, I want to go into the history of uh, why the web is file-based, what, what the problem is behind that. Um, then I want to look at the design, the, so the protocol side and the content side. And lastly, I want to give one possible solution. And I hope this sparks a lot of uh, discussion at the end. So starting uh, with the beginning of the web. So in the beginning in 1991, uh, Tim Berners-Lee designed the web with simplicity in mind. This is quite a famous uh, quote. Uh, I think a lot of people know it. And um, what happened is uh, HTTP was heavily FTP inspired but because um, FTP was the pre prevalent uh, protocol at the time. So um, you need a TCP handshake for every request. This is not a problem if your web page is just a single file. However, quickly people uh, like to uh, in, uh, include images, for example, in your web page. And uh, this quite quickly became a problem. And um, so there was the first uh, steps to standardize HTTP. And uh, if anyone wants to feel old, 1996 was the year I was born. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Wendy Hall has a t-shirt from the, the web conference 1994. Yeah. And um, so uh, the first steps for optimizing uh, the web was uh, some, some features called Keep Alive and Pipelining. Who knows about Keep Alive and Pipelining? Some people, okay. So the idea is that you can reuse the TCP connection and doesn't have to do the whole handshake every time. So the penalty for every request became less and less. However, there was some it was quite buggy. The implementation was quite complex. So a lot of browsers actually deactivated uh, the pipelining feature. So for the longest time, I mean, for a really long time until 20, 20, uh, 2015, uh, we had a penalty for every request. And then in 2020, uh, 2015, uh, there was a major shift. 
Uh, so the, the protocols moved from individual requests for every, re for every file to um, multiplexing over streams. So what this means is you can reuse the TCP connection and give every request a priority and just send data actually in both directions. And now with HTTP 3, which is now even based on UDP, um, we have mitigated more and more problems that um, led from individual requests. So we don't have TCP uh, head of line blocking anymore um, because we don't have TCP anymore. And we have some features like zero RTT, uh, where we can send data directly with the first answer from the server. So in conclusion, in the beginning, there was a lot of uh, overhead for every request. And now we have almost no overhead anymore. So from the server and the protocol perspective, this sounds fine. So we have solved the problem, right? Um, but looking at uh, how content uh, was produced, uh, we can. I want to highlight CSS and JavaScript here uh, quickly. So both of them are uh, used for styling and uh, web pages and making them interactive. There are some honorable mentions. I cannot go here, uh, into detail here because I don't have time. However, they were introduced quite early in the, in the process. So in 1995, 1996, and the DOM specification followed in 1998. And what happened is um, that they enabled rich and complex multimedia applications on the web. And people, uh, developers, started using more and more JavaScript and more and more CSS. But as we saw, uh, the whole time for HTTP 0.9 uh, HTTP until the end of HTTP 1.1, uh, we had an overhead for every request. So what developers did was, does anyone know what developers did to reduce the amount of requests? They bundled, yes. This is one of the, the major things I want to go in here. So bundling means you take all your source code that you want to transfer to client and put them into one big bundle, into one big file. And of course, this reduces the amount of uh, requests that you have. Um, however, uh, this has some downsides now. Um, the problem is that uh, bundlers became really popular as a mean of uh, creating your final package that is delivered to a, to a uh, client. And Webpack is the base for React, Angular, and Vue, and many, many other front-end frameworks. So Webpack is really, really popular right now. And looking at the history, we will see that it's just kind of unfortunate when it became popular. So um, Webpack is, uh, um, is a successor to browser Browserify and allows uh, developers to use import uh, syntax, for example. And it just became popular as we got the solution for uh, individual requests. It just became popular in around 2015. And um, so what do we do now? We have now um, a solution for a problem that doesn't exist anymore. And I want to quote here Erwin Hoffman, uh, he's a performance expert from the Netherlands. And he says, sorry, you cannot see it in the top, but uh, he says bundling is an anti-pattern in HTTP 2.2. In HTTP 2, bundling will end up impacting the download time of other resources as well because of the way HTTP 2 works. So he actually calls it an anti-pattern now. Um, so what is the solution? Erwin Hoffman suggests splitting the content. This just means um, yeah, splitting it up as in small individual chunks, doing the opposite of bundling and uh, sending it to a client. This sounds really easy. However, the status quo is this. This is called render blocking behavior in the top. You load everything, including the bundles, and then you get, you get a white page, and then you get all at once. This is called render blocking. If you just split up all of your code, and then load it asynchronously. What can happen is the middle one here is that your content will be displayed at different parts. For example, your web so HTML is uh, loaded first. There is no render blocking elements, so the HTML will be displayed. Maybe your cookie banner is distributed by the CN CDN and is really fast of delivering all the JavaScript for the cookie banner, so it will be displayed next. And maybe your, your styles uh, are the slowest part here. So this is heavily disliked by users. <laughs> um, it's called layout shift. And what we want actually is to think about what content do we deliver at which part of this uh, loading behavior. 
And um, there are three major challenges that I, we could identify that has to be so, have to be solved in order to make that commercially viable, to make it actually a solution that you can use as an alternative to Webpack. Webpack. So um, the first challenge I want to go into is maybe I can... Um, or this one, okay. Um, is to check what code is actually used on a web page. This is also called this whole area of uh, research is called dead code elimination. And it's a can of worms you may not want to open. Um, there are people actually um, doing their whole life research on this topic alone, is what code is used. For CSS, so for styling, this is not a problem. You can use a framework like Critical. But for JavaScript, this presents a major challenge. And uh, I want to encourage everyone to, to start researching in this topic. Um, the next one is after we know what code we, uh, we use, we also know to, uh, need to know where this code is used. So um, for CSS, actually, this is quite trivial. You can just use the CSS uh, rules and um, match them with the HTML tags. And then you know where the CSS is used. For CSS, I actually just have the example here. However, for JavaScript, again, this is a major challenge. <laughs> we also know, don't know where JavaScript is used. So now we know what code is used. We also know where the code is used. The final step is to split it up into small chunks and deliver it in the correct order. And um, this is also a major challenge because uh, there's no frameworks for, framework for that. So we have the option to stream over HTTP 2 and 3. The, the streaming is also already a deep, deeply integrated part of the protocol. We can also have browser features. Uh, Thomas Steiner uh, told me about that. It's called partial DOM rendering, um, where browsers already understand streamed HTML. So this is already integrated in the browser. But we have no framework for a developer to, uh, yeah, to do that. So I'm, I'm finished. I'm, I'm already finished. So this is the optimal uh, version, how it should look like. Um, I can show you a demo afterwards. However, so the key takeaways is the next generation of uh, web should uh, use splitting instead of bundling. Um, we suggest one possible solution is the, using the streaming capabilities of modern HTTP protocol. And there are some open challenges regarding making it commercially viable and actually being able to use it. So thank you. <laughs>